Welcome to the 26th episode of The Smartest People in the Room. If you've been following this series, you understand what we're doing here. We're shining a light on an incredibly smart, accomplished people and helping them share stories from their careers and lives, as well as anecdotes about their past, present, and future. Today, I am thrilled to present two highly accomplished, internationally known music and fashion industry moguls. Believe me, you're going to love this episode, folks. Before we get started, let me take care of a little bit of business. First, to our audience, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we want to showcase really smart people and the amazing work that they do day to day across the world. But the second reason is a little bit more nuanced. <clears throat> Some of you know that I am a music industry headhunter. By definition and function, my goal is to help people connect with companies. So in this series, my goal is to help you make such connections and I invite you to take full advantage of that opportunity. Specifically, I invite you to engage with the speakers and the other attendees in the chat of the Zoom. Please introduce yourselves, say hello to your friends and make some new ones and ask questions of our speakers. We will try to address as many of those as possible during the interview. I also wanna thank our sponsors for without their support, we could not do what we do. I want to thank First Horizon Bank, Bufkin Baker, Four Roses Bourbon, the Fairlane Hotel, Core Power Yoga, the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Lightning 100, Tennessee Brew Works, Moo TV, Jive Printing, Project Music, and also Organics. So folks, let's get down to business. Today's interviewer is a longtime friend of Hunu. Peggy Dold is Senior Vice President and Senior Director of Music and Entertainment for Iberia Bank slash First Horizon Sports and Entertainment Division. Peggy is, res is respected as a 20-year music executive who has worked in both Anglo and Hispanic music markets and has been based in New York, Miami, LA, and Nashville. Prior to joining Iberia Bank, which merged with First Horizon uh, earlier this year, Peggy owned her own companies called Navigation Partners Media PBC and Navigation Partners LLC, as well as held positions as Vice President International for Univision Music Group, Talent and Artist Relations Consultant for MTV Networks Latin America, Head of Artist Relations for Crescent Moon Records, which was a joint venture between Emilio Estefan and Sony Music International, <laughs> and she was Vice President of Marketing at Island Independent Label Group, where she oversaw U.S. domestic marketing for the Mango, Fourth and Broadway, Island Red Label, and G Street Independent, Great Jones, and Smash Label Imprints. Say all that three times fast. She's on the boards of Abbey Road Institute U.S. and IAFAR, which is Independent Alliance for Artist Rights, and is an active member of numerous other music industry organizations. Welcome, Peggy. And joining Peggy as today's special guest is Mr. Ian Rogers. Ian Rogers joined Moet Hennessy Louis Vuitton as Group Digital Officer in October of 2015. As CDO, Ian is responsible for building group-level digital excellence and accelerating digital transformation for LVMH Maisons. A graduate of computer, in computer science from Indiana University, Ian started his career in 1993 as webmaster successfully for Beastie Boys and at Winamp, which was sold to AOL in 1999. In 2001, he founded Media Code, which was sold to Yahoo in 2003, where he became VP and general manager <clears throat> of music. Ian joined Beats Music as CEO in 2013 and Apple as senior director after their acquisition of Beats. Ian contributed to the 2015 launch of Apple Music, including Beats One, their digital music streaming channel. Please welcome these two rock stars to the smartest people in the room. Take it away, guys. Thanks, Thank Tom. you. Thank you for the invitation and for the introduction, Tom. When you first launched Two New Nashville, I remember meeting with you in late 2014 and talking about potential guests for the series that could bring a diverse and meaningful perspective to the event. I remember telling you I thought Ian Rogers would be a great speaker. He was a music industry trailblazer and widely respected professionally and personally. But at that time, he was also traveling the world launching Apple Music. 
Shortly thereafter, in 2015, it was announced that he was leaving Apple and the music industry to work in the luxury goods industry as chief digital officer at LVMH, also known as Louis Vuitton Millet and Hennessy, which is not a, a very small career change for somebody, which also involved moving from Los Angeles to Paris. Which brings us to Ian. Ian, from what I see, you don't really have any small changes in your life, do you? Uh, yeah, why, well, you know, I always say, don't fuck around. Um, <laughs> or actually, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. Uh, you know, I, and I, I believe that. But no, I mean, for me, actually, I would argue that the first 20 years of my career was more like Groundhog Day. You know, we started doing digital music at the university level in 1992, and that was kind of my mission. You know, I was doing streaming music um, in the music library, you know, um, it was effectively Spotify streaming, you know, searching the card catalog and, and streaming music. But obviously it took a long time for that to get adopted into mainstream. So I think for me, you know, the, when, when, when we launched Apple music, it really, I remember Mark Geiger saying at a meeting we were at several years earlier, you know, when people were talking about Spotify, I remember Mark saying the game hasn't started yet. Until Apple's in the game, there's no game. So he was, I remember, you, can, you know Mark, so you can picture him saying it, right? The, 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 no one's even on the field. The game hasn't started yet until Apple's in the game. So I was thinking of that actually when we launched Apple Music and I'm sitting there at Moscone Center in like the fifth row and Tim Cook walks out with the words, you know, uh, we love music behind him. And honestly, like it felt like my life's work. You know, it felt like, wow, we, we did it. And, you know, streaming music, it went from science fiction in 1992 to on everybody's on every iPhone, um, you know, in 2014. And, uh, but I also just felt like, okay, I'm done. Like I did it. And now it's, now it's an oligopoly. Um, and you know, you and I aren't going to go create the next SoundCloud. So what's next? Like, where's the, where's the disruption? And, um, I think, you know, I'll, I'll probably personally, I'll probably be always just kind of chasing that, that disruption. And, um, you know, I like it when you can say, you know, the game hasn't started yet. And I think, you know, for me, when you look at the disruption in luxury retail, the game hadn't started yet. Like when I got here, music was kind of fully digitalized. It was in like the second era of its digital product, digital downloads to streaming. But, you know, uh, LVMH was doing three, four percent of total revenue as e-commerce. So it, it's, you know, and this year we'll do a double digit percentage. So that, that's the part that I like. I like it when it's kind of climbing the curve. Okay, but you know, if you think about it, I mean, we've only known each other casually and through the music industry, but we're both Midwest kids who at very young ages ended up living in Santa Monica. And I think that, you know, begs the elephant in the question room that comes up when people look at your background. You're a skateboarder from Goshen, Indiana and a very young entrepreneur who basically left Indiana to tour with the Beastie Boys with a young child in tow, if I remember correctly, and, you know, as their tech forward guru. How, ultimately, you know, as you said, you became this music tech disruptor who somehow ended up in a, you know, serious executive position for a luxury goods company living in France. That's not a particularly predictable path, especially for someone from Goshen, Indiana, nor from someone in the music industry, actually. So my question for you is, what sparks that type of an experience? I mean, is it imagination? Is it seeing possibility? I think, I think seeing possibility is the best way to describe it. Um, you know, Peggy, you know my mom, and what I would credit my mom with is, um, and by the way, for those who don't know my mom, there's probably more than one person here who knows my mom. My mom is, my mom knows as much about Americana music as probably anybody that you know. And that's saying a lot for you guys from Nashville, but it's true. Um, so she's certainly where I got, you know, a lot of my music, um, you know, sensibility from. But also I think that, you know, I think that what, what my mom and my dad both, you know, they, 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 all, they just taught me that anything was possible. And also I think that I didn't grow up with any, my, I don't think my parents had expectations for me the way that I hear about other people where they go, oh, my, my parents, like I was, I had to go to this school and they wanted me to be a doctor or an accountant or whatever that is. I don't know, you know, mom, you can tell us in the chat if you're there. Um, but I, as far as I know, they didn't have any expectations, especially when, you know, my girlfriend had a kid when I was 17. I think any expectations you had probably go out the window. Um, but I think it's that, that belief in, just kind of anything being possible. And then you put one foot 
in, in front of the other. I mean, I think that, you know, it is, it is, you know, like, I mean, you know, both my mom and I have run a number of marathons and, you know, how do you do it? It's really easy. You just put one foot in front of the other and eventually you get there. Um, you know, but some people look at that and they go, oh, I can never do that. But I think that, you know, I look at it and go, well, it's just putting one foot in front of the other and hold for, for you know, three or four hours. Like, I think I can do that. Um, and, and so I think it, I think it's that, I think there's also like, there's kind of big dreams in it and, and a little bit of patience too, because, um, you know, it's funny because, you know, before I worked for the Beastie Boys, I wanted to work for the Beastie Boys. Like I had this idea in my head and I didn't know if it was possible. And I, it's not like I would have jumped off a building if it hadn't happened, but I like, you know, it's sort of one of those things you put it into the universe and then you see what comes back. Um, and, but I think also luck and timing is a huge part of it. You know, I was a music fan that started a computer science degree in 1990 and graduated in 1994. So that's just like timing and being, and being lucky. You know, I mean, I, I, I started building websites, not because I was a genius or a visionary, but because it was there and I, I had a, a job to do and for the music library and it seemed like this web thing could be useful you know it was just sort of like you know you're you're looking you look at the tools in your toolbox and you use the tool that's most appropriate you know i built the first as far as i know search and streaming you know computer program for music not because i had any vision but because there was a visionary guy at the indiana university music library who hired me in a work study position and he said i have this vision that instead of you know a record behind the desk that it's going to be workstations throughout the library and you'll search the card catalog and then you'll be able to see the waveform and see a tiff file of the score and you know so i think that's that's all that's 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 really luck and i think then the, the last point i'd make is i've always i've definitely you know at some point in the not too distant past i realized that my career was a succession of of really great mentors um you know from you know, from my parents to the people that I skated with, who like taught me so much about about life, um, to Dr. David Fenske at, um, and really to, to Zoe's mom, who I wouldn't have made it out of Goshen if it hadn't been for her. She's much smarter than me. Um, to Dr. David Fenske at the Indiana University Music Library, to the Beastie Boys and John Silva, to Rob Lord, um, who I, you know, I did uh, Nullsoft with him and Justin and Tom, you know, to to Dave Goldberg, um, who, who bought us at Yahoo and set me up for success at Yahoo. Peter Gocher, who was our chairman at, at, um, at Media Code, who was the, the inventor of Pro Tools and the founder of DigiDesign. Um, Jimmy Iveen and Luke Wood, who really like did a ton for me at Beats. And then you know, with Trent Reznor, Dre as well, Zane Lowe. Eddie Q at Apple, and now working with, um, you know, with Ben Arano and Tony Belloni and, and the Arno family, and really all of the people at LVMH, there's such an amazing cast of characters there. I've just been super lucky to be, you know, to be surrounded by, you know, really great people. Um, you know, so I, I don't know, I made some combination of all of those things. I couldn't really put, um, put any one thing on it, but possibility from what you said, I think there's definitely, there's two kinds of people in the world. There's some people where, you know, what they see is um, they see ways that things will go wrong. And there's a lot of value in that. Um, I, I just see opportunity, you know. Um, I remember Luke, who in, in, the, in the Beats family, you know, Luke Wood was, was, ran the electronics, Beats Electronics. He brought me in to spin this software company out called Beats Music. And um, Luke is a constant pessimist by, by admission. I remember him saying to me once, and I'm, the, and I'm the opposite. And that was like the role we played. And I remember him saying to me, you know, the thing about being a pessimist is eventually you're right. And I was like, oh man, that's definitely not who I want to be. I'd rather like, I'd rather have every day be like full of optimism and joy and then eventually be wrong. Eventually get like, like doused with that bucket of cold water because, you know, your optimism didn't pan out. Then live every day looking around the corner waiting to be right. That's just not, not who I am. Oh, I love that. Well, so, but, you know, you mentioned, you know, having a vision and seeing possibility. Have you ever had to choose between your dream and feeding your family? Yes. I mean, so there have definitely been, uh, you know, when I, you know, we, we never had any money in college, you know, um, uh, Susie and I, um, and I left, I left home at, at 17 and just sort of 
was like, oh, I wanted to prove that I can, that I can do this, you know? So we, um, Zoe's mom and I got married really so that we could get financial aid and go to college. And, and really it was fine. You know, we didn't need much money. We were in college. Um, and you know, we, we lived together until we didn't have to. And then I moved across the street and, you know, we moved to California at the same time, but you know, there was a point at which, you know, I, I was paying Susie's rent here in Southern California and I didn't have my own place to live. And I was sleeping, you know, on the couch at my office. I did have a job, thankfully. Um, making, you know, $36,000 a year. So not too bad in 1995, but not enough to pay rent for two people. Um, and, you know, so whatever, I, I became the world's worst boyfriend to, uh, to someone at that, at that, at that point in time, the, the guy with, um, you know, the kid and the ex-wife and, and a broken car and no apartment, but you know, I, um, that's, that's, that's the way it goes. And then I think, you know, we, we, um, we made a little bit of money on Nullsoft. I didn't make a lot of money on, on that. I hadn't been there very long. It was a great thing to be a part of, but you know, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't a big payday for me personally. And then Rob and I started this new company. Um, we did, there was a grand Royal episode in between, which could be like a documentary. Um, but, but then we, um, we started this new company right our, you know, beginning at the end of 2000, beginning of 2001. And we were doing it out of our own pockets, which meant mostly out of Rob's pocket because Rob made more money on Nullsoft than I did. Um, and, and we were like, you know, trying to fundraise like you do with a startup. What we, it was a pretty hard time to start a company, a pretty hard time to start a music tech company. And I'm, you know, we had a, we had a meeting at Microsoft Venture Capital on September 11th, 2001. Like I was supposed to fly to San Francisco that day. You know, it was one of those things I can still remember how it unfolded because I was like, oh, well, whatever, I'm flying to San Francisco. It's like, this happened in New York. It's hard to imagine that something in New York could affect your flight between LA and San Francisco. And you're like, wait a minute, the airport's closed, what? And then we're like, okay, well, I guess we're not gonna do this Microsoft meeting today, but we'll reschedule it for next week. Eventually you realize, wait a minute, there are no meetings happening. <laughs> no one's getting funded for the rest of the year, right? And you know, my solution at that time was you just don't pay taxes. You know, I, I was like, you know, I couldn't, I was taking a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a paycheck from the company, but I couldn't afford to pay taxes on it and pay my rent. So we just kind of like carried that balance forward with the, with the company knowing or saying that, okay, when we get funded, I'm owed this back revenue um, so that we can do it. I, and to be honest, like those were the only, the only times when I, when I had, you know, kind of when I was really there. I mean, I, there was a time when I lived in Topanga when I remember going to my bank account and realizing that the government had, had closed it because I owed, because of the taxes that I owed that I hadn't paid. You know, when I moved to California, I had bought an Ensonic ASR 10 sampler uh, in college on a credit card, which, I, you know, I think some of the people here might know, might appreciate that the Ensonic ASR 10 was something I had to have when I was uh, 19 or 20, even if I couldn't afford it. And they just hand out credit cards with bags of M&Ms all over campus, right? So obviously they want me to order the sam sampler from Sam Ash. And then of course I never made a payment on it. And then when I got, and I was like, well, well they'll, they'll never find me, right? I'm gonna move to California. Um, <laughs> of course that doesn't work. And ultimately I ended up having to pay that bill. But I mean, it, I've never, I can't say that I've ever really, uh, you know, um, that, that's the, that's kind of the, the only time I've, I've had to choose, but I've been, I've been super fortunate, um, you know, along the way we had a, we had a nice, a nice, we did, we had a nice outcome with media code ultimately with, with Yahoo. It wasn't huge by today's standards, but it was good for our investors. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and, but you also, you make sacrifices when I left AOL, I'm sorry, when I left Yahoo and went and did media code, I took a 50% pay cut. I put, a decent amount of my own money, like really like a, like most of my savings basically into the company. And ultimately the company wasn't successful. So I had five years of opportunity cost, five years where I could have been making a bigger salary if I had stayed at, at Yahoo, um, my own savings invested in the company. And, you know, ultimately it wasn't a good outcome, but then, you know, you move into the next thing and we had a good outcome with, with, with Apple, but anyway, yeah, you learn more from the failures from the, than you do from the successes anyway. So hopefully it balances out somewhere. Exactly. Wow. Well, I'm glad to know that you weren't like scavenging, scavenging around in garbage looking for food <laughs> at any point. Um, for those who aren't familiar with LVMH, 
It's a luxury goods company that has brands ranging from high fashion to wine and spirits to high-end jewelry, hotels, and more. Again, it's not the normal music industry pivot. Yet, according to the media and to your high profile in that industry, you're a digital pioneer, disrupting online retail, elevating technology inside of the organization, as well as in the, the industries that you service. So given the in-depth experience and perspective you must now have from working at LVMH for the past five years, combined with the current pandemic that has had such a severe impact on physical retail stores, what do you see as the future of retail? Um, hold on, I was like looking in the chat. Um, for, just for, for Michelle, I'm not related to Benji. Um, I don't have any, uh, I, don't, I, have, I don't have any brother or sister. My, da my dad's only child, so I'm the only Rogers. Um, but uh, I knew Benji once upon a time, um, but no, we're not, we're not related. Uh, hold on, was there anything else we wanted to respond to? Sorry, sorry. Okay, the future of retail. I mean, I, I think that there's actually, you know, the, the CEO of Fendi, um, you know, summed it up, I think, really well uh, th this year. Um, I was talking to him just after the, uh, just after the confinement here and things were, you know, we were trying to figure out what it looks like to get, to get back to normal. And he said, you know, we probably need less square footage, meaning less square footage in our stores, but not zero stores. That's not what he meant. You know, what he, what he meant about the stores is, um, you know, the stores are changing and I'll get to kind of what he means by that. So less square footage overall, more people. And what he means by that is more people um, interacting with customers. So maybe you're interacting at a distance like we are now, but there are real human beings on the other side of, of this retail experience. Um, those people probably need better tools, you know, tools like this one, or, you know, we, we talk about, you know, what does that combination of, of FaceTime and Louis Vuitton look like, right? Um, if we build a store, it had better be a temple, right? So like um, Doug Stevens says, you know, a store, the etymology of the word store is storage, right? That, that use of a store is, is, is not needed anymore. People don't go to a store for something they can do really successfully from their couch. That's over. So we want our stores to be experiences and, and you know, luxury does that incredibly well. If, if you have that kind of store experience, which is, you know, literally just a place to pick something up, uh, that, that's probably going away. Um, you know, it still has a value, especially in places like where I live, where getting a package is actually a challenge because, um, you know, you live in a multifamily dwelling and, you know, if you're not home, sometimes they, they just don't leave you the package, it gets returned. Um, so there's still, you know, there's still a lot of utility in, in having a place to pick something up, but there's other solutions for that that, aren't, that don't require expensive storefronts on expensive streets, you know, real estate wise. Um, and also, as the CEO of Fendi said, that store had better have a broadcast studio inside of it. Because with the kind of the retail that, that we do, you're creating culture, you create culture as a prerequisite to, to selling the product. It's just like the music business. I always say, you know, I think that's one of the ways that the, the business I found myself in at LVMH is similar to the music business. You know, when you're selling music, you're not selling, um, you know, a stream of bits in an MP3 file or an AAC file. You know, you're selling what that music means to someone. You're selling what Billie Eilish means to a 13 year old, right? Um, and, you know, it's the same thing. If you're buying a Dior handbag, you're not buying it for its incredible utility and its five star reviews. You know, you're buying it because they have made the culture of Dior mean something. And then when you wear that bag, it expresses something about you. It's actually about self-expression. Um, and I think anyone that's in the business of self-expression uh, has, has, you know, has, has seen growth over the, over the era of Instagram, right? If, if, you're, if, you're, if your job is to help me identify with my tribe and differentiate myself from another tribe, then you know, you've, you've probably seen growth in the, in the past 15 years. Um, so I think the future of retail I mean, there's another angle on this. So I was saying specifically about, about stores and we'll simply do more at a distance. And, um, and that, that kind of, in a way, goes without saying. But I think the thing that's maybe more controversial that I believe is that this notion of kind of buying wholesale and selling retail is, is it's, it's not tenable, generally speaking. Um, I think that, you know, in the future, everyone is one of um, a magazine 
a search engine or a brand, right? And so, you know, if you think about it from a consumer perspective, you either help me discover um, or you help me find, or you give, you know, you, you, or you're something that I, that I want, something that I, you know, subscribe to. So, you know, and, and in, in, in the, the fashion world, you know, you, that discovery could happen on Instagram. It could happen in a magazine. It could happen from a friend. It could happen. It happens all over the place, but you probably turn to something like Google um, to find what it is you're looking for. And then you'll largely be taken to a brand site. Right now there are tons of multi-brands, but if you think about it over time, a brand is a much better place to buy what you're looking for. And that combination of, of a trusted brand site plus Apple pay, it kind of fulfills the purpose. It's actually one of the things that I like about this business is that there is a broad recognition of, of the value of direct to consumer, right? If you think about it, every brand wants to be one of the top four brands in the luxury space. Who are they? Louis Vuitton, Dior, Hermes, Chanel. What do all four brands have in common? Their entire distribution channel is them. You're not gonna find Louis Vuitton in any multi-brand boutique. You'll not find it on sale. Same thing for Dior, same thing for Hermes, same thing for Chanel. The only way they sell is through them. And every brand in fashion wants to be one of those four brands when they grow up. So this entire industry has this like belief in direct consumer, which is, amazing for me because I spent five years in the music business running around telling people that if they got a fan of their website, they shouldn't send them to iTunes because now iTunes owns that customer and you just lost your opportunity to own that customer. And everyone went, yeah, but I want the chart position, you know, and okay. So I, it's great to be in an industry that recognizes the value of direct to consumer and does it at an extraordinarily high level where, you know, the average, order value for a customer is on the order of a thousand euros. Um, and you know, the lifetime value of a customer is huge and you can afford um, to offer them an incredible experience by, you know, by, by interacting with them directly in a way that's very human. So I think that, you know, that, I think that that, I think that another answer to your question is to say that the future of retail is direct consumer, which is maybe the same thing I would have said at Topspin, although I was off by order of magnitude. Well, I, I mean, that right idea. you learned right. that from you, I think, at some South by Southwest workshop or something, it all made so much sense. But let me ask you, do you have any thoughts about like Amazon and Alibaba and how all this now comes into play in this new world order we're talking about? Wait, say it again. Hold on. I'm sorry. I'm like catching up on the chat room. Should I not be doing this? And you <laughs> no, can see where you feel like. I, I do my, that. I will go down a rabbit hole in this conversation. I have to be in here to see it. <laughs> okay. um, you know. My question is, do you have any thoughts about Amazon and Alibaba? Definitely. I mean, I think, um, I mean, look, we, 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 we think we, we work with both and we talk, we talk about both every single day at LVMH. I think they're very, very, very different um, from our perspective. Um, I'll start with Alibaba, actually, because it's actually more interesting than Amazon. Um, for those who don't know, I mean, Alibaba, Chinese company, and they have a, they have a number of products. Um, but their kind of biggest product from my perspective in my industry is called Tmall. Um, best way to think about Tmall is I'm trying to, you know, it's, it's tough because Tmall is, is kind of like Amazon marketplace only is the best way to think about it. Um, because Tmall, unlike Amazon, they don't buy wholesale and sell retail. They only do marketplace. And then, you know, basically the brands ship them themselves just to, to oversimplify it. They also have something called Taobao, which is the, the consumer to consumer market, which is, um, you know, more like eBay. Think of it, think of it that way. So the, the um, you know, the, the counterfeit shit is in Taobao, but, you know, they've really tried to legitimize and they have this thing called Tmall, which is very legitimate. And it's, it's amazing. You know, when I talk to my friends in China who live there, they buy literally everything on, on Tmall. Like, as my one friend was trying to like get this through my head, she said, I bought my dog on Tmall. Right. If, if you can buy it on Tmall, they prefer to buy it on Tmall because there's also there's a loyalty program. So you, you know, you want to like build up those loyalty points. So if you could buy it one place, but you could also buy it on Tmall, you're going to buy it on Tmall because there's some value to you for, for buying it on Tmall. Um, you know, the interesting thing to cut to the chase is that many years ago, four years ago now, um, I had a meeting between the, the then president and CEO of Dior, um, Sidney Toledano and the CEO of Alibaba, whose name is Daniel Zhang. And it was an amazing meeting. Um, 
And I really felt like a translator, right? Even though I was the only native English speaker, they both speak good English, but they're there. They grew up with a different language. Um, but I was really translating between the luxury industry and then the tech industry and, and even kind of more specifically at a distance, this like fast paced Chinese tech industry. And what, I, what, what, what was fun about it is we were able to get to the heart of what um, companies like ours might want from a marketplace like theirs. And I said, look, we love Tmall. Um, if there was a shopping mall across the street that had 200 million daily visitors, the only model was concession, meaning that it's, it's the brand who gets the customer. Um, they only take 5% in terms of rev share. All of our brands would want to be there, right? And that's really what Tmall is. It's a highly trafficked shopping mall whose only model is concession and whose rev share or take rate is 5% or less. So it's, a, it's an incredible business um, model for us. So I said, okay, let's be specific about what we don't like. I said, you can't put luxury next to value, right? When we go into a shopping mall with one of our stores, we don't go next to the dollar store, right? There's a, a luxury part of the mall. There's a reason that Steve Jobs um, followed Louis Vuitton with, was, that was his you know, kind of distribution strategy for opening Apple stores. Um, because, you know, it's, it's a, there's a, you're, you're attracting, a, 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 attracting a certain kind of customer um, and that foot traffic is valuable. Okay. Um, and also the second part is, is that you can't take away the storytelling because when you take the product and you just put it up there with a picture and a price, you're literally removing margin from the product because in our industry, storytelling equals margin. And I would argue, you know, if anybody who saw me, if there's anybody in the chat room who was at the Aspen conference, where I think I met Bob Lefsetz, um, you know, where my pitch, I started by saying iTunes is a spreadsheet that plays music. Because I grew up with vinyl and I still buy a lot of vinyl. And I love the context. Music has context. It's, again, music is not sonic, it's cultural. Right, it really is, and, you know. And I think we all know that. But the you know, same thing for our products. So if you take the culture away from our products, our, our products, you know, you're not you're not looking to buy like it's not a commodity. You're not just looking for you know. You're looking you're looking to understand the culture around this item. And what I didn't want was what we got in music, frankly, where the internet was full of culture about music. Right, we had all of these. You know, incredible like websites and lyric sites and and you know images and and then you go to the consumption experience and it looks and feels like a fucking spreadsheet like no that won't work we will not exist in that environment and um and daniel zhang who is an amazing individual he came up to me the next morning we were at a conference together and he came up to me and he goes value and value plus right and i said exactly because i had told him what i learned from scott galloway who's coming, I think, right, with, uh, with Dick? Is this happening? Am I right about this? That will be a fucking fireworks show. Scott is, Scott is incredible. Um, Scott had said, there's, there's value and value plus, and they're completely different. And what I said to Daniel Zhang is I said, my job is to make sure that there is a bright yellow line between value and value plus, right? And so Daniel Zhang came up to me the next morning and he was like, value and value plus, right? I said, yep. Six months later, they launched the Tmall Luxury Pavilion. And it was exactly that. It was an area for only luxury brands and, um, and where the brands could control what you saw. Okay, so look at what Amazon launched two weeks ago, their, their luxury fashion place. Um, we had the same conversation with Amazon around the same time. And I would argue that there's a certain arrogance there that they were like, yeah, that's not how it works at Amazon, right? Um, okay, well, I guess our brands won't be there then, right? I mean, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but if you look at what Amazon launched a couple weeks ago, they launched a luxury only place, um, only available in the app. And it's actually, it looks pretty nice. I have to say, uh, where, you know, the, the amount of, you know, merchandising and, and the quality of the images and the way that the products are presented, it's, it's super high value. Um, and so I think it's, you know, they're, you know, that, that's so, so you get a sense of kind of how we think about it. I mean, you know, I, I think the real question is, you know, what value do these guys offer in the different categories? So 
Um, you know, last point I'll make on this, just because it, hopefully you find it interesting. I think if you're thinking about the wines and spirits category for us, there's a lot of value at Amazon actually, right? If I want um, the, you know, the, the yellow label Vauve Clicquot bottle, okay, I'm happy to buy that at Amazon. That, that makes sense. I know what I'm getting um, in, in that case. Um, I think though, when it comes to, if you think about a, a Celine handbag though, again, if I'm coming from Instagram to Google Shopping, to Celine.com, to Apple Pay, why do I need Amazon in that transaction? I, I don't actually, like as a consumer, I just don't, there's no value being added. There's tons of stuff for which Amazon adds value. You know, my, my daughter just turned 14 last week. She wanted colored pencils, like those expensive, like watercolor, uh, Faber-Castell, you know, colored pencils. What am I gonna do? I'm going to go to FaberCastell.com. No, they're two X the price on FaberCastell.com. They are anywhere else. Um, am I going to go to like ColoredPencils.com? No, I'm not. I mean, Amazon adds a ton of value in that transaction because I know I'm going to get a good price, good service. I'm going to get the product I want. If there's a problem, I can go back to them. So I would add. They, I would offer that they add a, a ton of value in that particular transaction. But on the Celine handbag side, as a as a customer of Celine, I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better service from Celine.com than I am from Amazon.com. I might even get a phone call. I might get, you know, I'm going to get treated well when I go back in the next time, they're going to hand me a glass of champagne. You know, there's a, there's actually a, a ton of value um, from buying it direct as opposed to buying it from the distributor. So I think that's, you know, that's the, um, you know, that, I think that's the thing to consider is, and I think, you know, I'm sorry, I know I, I, I talked too long, but hopefully, you know, these are, these are, you know, interesting points for you. But I, I, I think that, um, you know, what the, the, the question to ask is, is, you know, just, is it necessary? And remember that like customers are not stupid. They don't, we don't go to Amazon for everything. Nobody like opens up Amazon is like, I need a flight from LA to New York. You know, like, no, people know where to go for what. Um, and you know, I mean, if I want used records, I go to Discogs. If I want, you know, it, it's, we, uh, we know where to go for what, like customers get trained they go where the supply is, period. And especially when, you know, all of our businesses are very supply limited businesses. Um, and, you know, just like Vinyl Me Please is a very supply limited business. Um, so I don't need to go to Amazon for Vinyl Me Please records. When Vinyl Me Please sends me an email, I go directly to Vinyl Me Please and I try to, you know, try to buy that thing that's a limited edition of 300 so I don't have to email or text Matt later and be like, yo, dude, can you get me a copy of that thing? Cause I slept on it. Um, you know, so that's a, yeah, I think, I think, I think that's the thing to remember. It's not about, it's not about everything. And I think that that thing to keep in mind that I found is everything is either a magazine, meaning you use it for discovery, a search engine, meaning you use it to find or a brand, meaning it's a brand. It has value. It has a monopoly on itself. A music artist has a monopoly on themselves. Louis Vuitton has a monopoly on themselves. Uh, so, you know, and I think that the problem is when people are unclear about who they are or they think they're more than one of those things because nobody is. And then you end up like Yahoo. You couldn't decide if they were a vertical or a horizontal and they became neither. So, sorry, long answer. Well, you know, it's interesting because you mentioned culture and, you know, whether we're talking Louis Vuitton or Celine or we're talking the Beastie Boys or we're talking, you know, anybody, culture, you know, whether it's music or whether it's a brand, it is, as you said, it's about the culture. I remember when I worked for Chris Blackwell, Chris saying, everything starts in the street. If it hasn't started in the street, there will be no sustaining, you know, capability at all. And, you know, Bob Marley is probably the most brilliant example of that ever. And I'm thinking about where the street is. I'm thinking about where discovery is. I'd like to hear your thoughts on TikTok. I think, I mean, TikTok is, is um, it's not a small invention. And I think, you know, to, well, I guess, first of all, I mean, I, to me, uh, what I like about the internet, I mean, what I've always feel like I've been is like a, a, a student of how the internet is changing culture. So that's why for me, TikTok is contextualized in, you know, within everything that's come um, before it. If you think about it, you know, I came home from school every day and I watched the Brady Bunch or Gilligan's Island because it was, you know, it was what was on and I was bored, right? I really think that the difference in TikTok, TikTok is, is that it's broadcast, but it's personalized. So to, to contrast it from, so let's go back to, you know, what was, 
uh, so Andy Weissman at Union Square Ventures, he, he has this great kind of evolution of content on the internet, which is what the internet did is it made all the stuff available. Like, boom, wow, look, now, now we're not limited by, you know, what's on the FM dial, what's on television, what's the magazine rack, where we really have like unlimited choice, you know? And then the, the, the history of the internet is about filters on that choice. So first we had Yahoo, which was like automotive, and then you click and then it's like Audi, and then you click and then, you know, so it was about like organizing it into um, portals. Um, and, you know, Google was about organizing it via keyword search. And then Facebook was about reorganizing all of the stuff on the internet via your social graph. Um, Instagram is maybe about organizing the world's media based on who you follow. But TikTok is about organizing all the content based on your preference, right? So that's, that I think is where it fits in that, in that timeline. And so that's, if you think about it, that's very different from Facebook or Instagram, right? If, I, if you don't follow someone on Instagram, you're not going to see it except on that, you know, the search page that very few people go to. Um, whereas TikTok said, no, no, that's front and center. For you is front and center. That is actually the thing. Um, so what that does is it gives them this incredible fire hose, right? Um, you know, that means that if something looks like people like it, they can put it at everybody who might like it very quickly. And that, that's really like unprecedented on the internet. You know, we were reliant on, um, you know, what they call dark social, which is a pretty bad term, but that kind of peer to peer sharing for that kind of virality before. So I think the main you know, difference with TikTok, I think there's a, there are a few things, you know, one is the screen real estate, you know, just look at the screen real estate on, on Instagram, the screen real estate on YouTube and the screen real estate on TikTok, which is like absolutely full bleed. Um, then look at the tools that they give to the audience to, to create completely unprecedented. Um, and then the fact that for you is, is front and center. Um, and I think that that's the, that's really the, the difference in the dynamic and, and they've, you know, they've made, they've, com they've made a completely different kind of like remix culture, social dynamic, um, you know, out of that where it's got like its own, its own momentum. I saw a piece last week that was written that I thought was really good. It was a bit about um, what was, you know, what was special about TikTok content. And they said, the way they put it was that, that um, entertainment value equals um, production value plus social value. Um, and I think we all know those things are things with insanely high production value and relatively little social value, which still have high entertainment value. And then there are things which have very low production value, but very high social value. And when you nail it is when it's got high production value and high social value. Let's look at, you know, WAP by, uh, um, you know, Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion. Great production value, great social value. Boom, home run, right? Um, so I, I think that there is um, something somewhat predictable about it. I feel like I should be following, uh, following the, 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 the chat. Uh, so wait, people, people, um, da -da -da -da, magazine search engine. Yeah. And then uh, Michelle's saying like magazine equals discovery. What I mean guys is I mean, ma you have to use magazine as kind of a generic term. I don't mean, um, I'll show you like, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll admit it. I'm fucking old, so I still subscribe to Mojo. I put the fucking Beatles on the cover in 2020, right? Mojo every year. That's right. That's the answer. Um, and God bless. So I, that's not exactly what I what I mean. What I mean is, let, let me let me give you the example in the in MySpace in the in the fashion world. Net the Porte. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a the Net the Porte group is about a billion in revenue. They're they're owned by Richemont. They're operated together with an off price um, retailer called Ukes. So they're Ukes Net the Porte. That's, that's, that's what they are. What is net the porte? Okay. It's a great question. I think that the answer is their brand because they, uh, they buy wholesale and they sell retail. Um, since they buy wholesale and they sell retail, they're curated by definition. They don't have everything, right? Google has this massive index, but, but net the porte, they buy wholesale, they sell retail. They're like a record store. You walk in, there's only so many records. It's not Discogs. It's rough trade, right? So you walk in, there's only, there's only so many records. But what have they done? They've literally created a magazine, right? They've got a magazine called Porter. 
Um, and, you know, and, and that's kind of been their calling card for 15 years or more as they, that we're a magazine. And it no doubt has value. You know, people do discover on Net Deporte. We also know that consumer behavior, we know this from, from primary research, consumer behavior is I discover on Net Deporte and I um, purchase on Farfetch, right? So they are a magazine, like, a, like truly a magazine on some level. Now, if you came to me with a business idea and you said, I've got an idea, I'm gonna start a magazine, but I take inventory risk on every photo I take. I mean, who would invest in that business, right? So that, that's, that's effectively what it is. Now, so I would argue that they are a brand with a thin layer of magazine who tells their investors they're a search engine. And I just think that that's fundamentally broken. That reminds me of what I was doing at Yahoo, um, where we were a vertical, but we were pretending we were a horizontal, right? If that makes sense. We were, we had a basically a music magazine, but we pretended we had all the world's music, right? Um, we curated, but we wanted you to come start your search with us. And who did we lose to? We lost to YouTube in the end because we had deals with three record labels of three of the four at the time. Um, Lyra Cohen told me that, you know, I wasn't giving him near enough money, so I couldn't have his music videos. But um, YouTube had everything. Um, how's the irony of that, by the way? Yeah, exactly. I was thinking the same thing. Lior, come on, man. I love Lior. Um, the, um, and, uh, you know, so I, I think that, that's what I mean by that. By magazine, I mean, you know, and also a magazine has to be, um, uh, it's, a magazine is editorial in that, like, pure way. Like the way that Buddy Head was editorial. The way that Pitchfork you know, could give a Ryan album, Adams album a zero and a Kanye album a 10 because they were like, we don't, you know, there was a time and I think that Kanye Nast ownership probably changed that, I don't know. Um, but there was a time when you, if you were a record label, you really had a hard time getting Pitchfork on the phone because they wanted to be, they wanted, they wanted to be independent. They wanted to be curators. Um, and so like, that's what a magazine needs to be. You can't, you can't own inventory and be a magazine. You can't be a record label and be a magazine. You know, um, you know, that's like these fucking record labels that have these playlist companies. Like what kind of garbage is that? Like who fell for that trick? Um, you know, so anyway, that, that's what, that's what I mean. Sorry, I'm responding to. Uh, Actually, it leads me to the next question perfectly. And which is, what do you think of the music industry? now that you've had this experience in the luxury goods sector. <clears throat> and no, don't hold question. back, yeah, just don't hold back. No, it's a good question because I mean, part of the, part of the best thing about being you know, out of it is I'm back to just being a fan. I'm still a fan, I'm still a consumer. Um, I mean, any, anyone, who, anyone who knows me will tell you that I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm as big a fanatic as I was. I'm probably a bigger fanatic than I was when I was was 17 and, and um, yeah, I mean, the, the, my, my girlfriend was, is, is telling me that we have uh, somebody coming to clean the fireplace on Friday and I have to get all the vinyl out of the fireplace. Yeah, I don't know if you can, if you, <laughs> if you can please. Uh, so you can't really see it in there. Hold on, sorry. Ah, shit, can't see it from here. There you go, the vinyl that's in the fireplace. So, um, you know, I, I uh, you know, but I, I think that, I think, I think it's a super challenging business. I mean, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know, but I think that our dream at Topspin was that, you know, people would be able to build these like direct connections with their consumers, uh, with their fans. And, um, and that that would be, you know, the way that, the way that we would, that we would interact. And I think that music has proved to be more of a commodity than we hoped it would be. Um, I think that you know Bandcamp has executed the dream much better than we did uh, at Topspin because I think we thought the opportunity was bigger. You know, we thought the opportunity was going to be people spending, you know, a lot on their favorite brands, not like just buying a piece of vinyl or a T-shirt. We thought there was going to be more, you know, more to it than that. Um, I think that a lot of it turned out exactly as we predicted. Like I would look back to you know sitting with Dave Goldberg back in two thousand three, two thousand four. When we had done the math, you know, we knew, I mean, we launched Yahoo Music Unlimited in May of 2005, you know, pretty silly to launch on, on uh, basically Spotify pre iPhone, but you know, we, we just believed, we believed the same way Geiger did that subscription was the path 
that it would be somewhere between five and ten dollars a month that the music industry would grow again when the number hit 70 million subscribers so i think we had that kind of general piece of it um you know really right and i'm super happy to see growing growing revenues in the recorded music space again um but i think it's you know it's still obviously a market where you have you know tons of aspirants and you know a few winners and um you know and and, and i I, I think, yeah, I, I, I wish I knew, I wish I knew kind of, you know, better than that, what the, what, what the, what the answer was. I mean, you got, to be honest, like I haven't been in it for five years. You guys probably know, um, you know, you know, better and know, know more than me on the question. You have though, obviously kept up with AI, with machine learning, with data, I presume. So my question is, how do you see this applying to the future of commerce? Well, I mean, I, I really think so. I've been on um, now. I'll, I'll totally geek out on you because I, I, I've been thinking, especially for our business, like the, the the impact of artificial intelligence and machine learning is is where I spend you know a lot of my a lot of my thought um, process. I think the thing the thing to recognize with artificial intelligence and machine learning is that it's not just a continuation of um, of kind of you know this move to, to hardware and software. So if you look at you know the the history of consumer computing, you know we had personal computers and um, and then this thing called the internet came along and that and that kind of opened up um, new modes of of opportunity, new ways of doing business. But um, you know data and artificial intelligence is is a it's a it's more of a of a scientific uh, um, innovation than kind of a consumer innovation. And what I, what I mean by that is, you know, if you think about what it means to build a software product or build a hardware product, it's very complicated, but it's, it's, um, it's you know, in some ways like building a house or building, designing a car, you know, you build a, you, you know, you have a, you have a design, you build a blueprint, you have engineers and, and you build this thing that, that you had in your head. Whereas data science is more like an experimental science. You know, what you're doing with it is, you know, you're, you're, you're looking into darkness and trying to find form, trying to find, you know, what's going on. So in, in, in our industry, um, I was just having this conversation with someone over lunch, we have these incredibly intuitive leaders. And that intuition is what's been driving the business for a long time. Um, you could say the same in the music business, right? It's, it's, it's like A&R in a way. You've got, you know, people like Chris Blackwell who had intuitions about, about you know, I, I, I see something and I know what it, what it could be. I think that it's the same in, 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 the, in the fashion business, right? You have, you have creative people, you have people who, um, you know, back creative people with operational efficiency. But I think increasingly that operational efficiency that, um, you know, groups like LVMH add to the creative people, um, you know, like Jonathan Anderson, like Matthew Williams, like Virgil Abloh, like Eddie Slaman, you know, we, there's a, an, you know, an apparatus behind them. Increasingly, that will include artificial intelligence and machine learning in addition to that, that human intuition. Um, so I, I think that, you know, I, I actually think that you'll start to see people who are leveraging that intuition pull away from the pack versus people who aren't leveraging that, that intuition. Um, because especially when you're dealing with more and more niche markets that are more and more global, you, you are trying to, you know, you know, you're trying to find the people, you know, globally who are going to connect with what you're doing um, more than you're trying to, um, you know, create something that's for everyone because people have unlimited choice and there's nothing that's for everyone. Um, so I think that using data is, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be so powerful in, in how that's done. And I think on some level as consumers, we want it, you know, I mean, if you could predict for me the things that I would love on Bandcamp, I'd be so thankful. Um, really like I would want that as a, as a consumer. Um, if you could do it, I mean, it's what, you know, we've, we've tried to do with personalization for a very long time. Um, and I think it's still under invested in, 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 in the, in the music space. But I think it's, I think it's a, um, it's, I, I actually just think it's where the market value comes from. You know, if you look at, if you look at LVMH, you know, we're, we're kind of on the order of, of 50 million euros in revenue on an, on an annual basis. Um, and, you know, if you think about where does the next 
10, I'm sorry, billion, where does the next 10 billion incremental come from? It probably comes from leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning on top of our, on the data asset that we own. And that's the, that's the other part of it that's interesting is we already have the data asset. You know, we, we, have, we have customer data, we have um, product data. You know, so it's different than, than kind of, you know, the, the, the move to the mobile web. That was really about, you know, the customers having powerful computers and high-speed internet connections in their pockets, where this is actually about doing exactly what the investment thesis of LVMH is, which is we back creativity with operational efficiency. So part of that operational efficiency will certainly be, um, will be leverage of data. The last thing I'll say though is, you know, and I was alluding to it, but you know, it's something I learned at Apple, you know, at, at Apple, um, you know, what they would say is that consumer trust is more valuable than consumer data. Um, you know, I was sitting in Eddie Q's staff meeting for a year when they were launching Apple Pay. And I can tell you that they were very concerned that they didn't get any consumer data. They didn't want to like get it and not, not tell people about it. They actually wanted to make sure they didn't get it because they really believed um, from a business perspective that consumer trust is more valuable than consumer data and that there was value to not having the data. And I think similarly for, um, you know, for luxury, privacy and luxury are synonymous and consumer trust is more valuable than consumer data, but personalization and luxury are also synonymous. So you wanna use the data to serve the customer, period. Um, so, you know, what I always say is that there's two ends of the spectrum and on one end, you do nothing with data. And on the other end, you're, you do creepy things with data. <laughs> we're gonna be closer to the do nothing end, but we're not going to do nothing. You know, you wanna do things that are in, in, in service of the customer. Wow. Okay. So I, I know Tom's going to need us to wrap up. I'd like to ask you one last question. Mm -hmm. And that is, if someone were to give you a billion dollars to invest in the future, what would you do with it? Oh man. I didn't have, I didn't have, I didn't have that one. Can I invest in my future with it? Or no, <laughs> humanity. Um, a thousand million dollars. Well, I would take 3% of it and buy Bitcoin. That would be the first thing that I would do. Um, and then once that was done, I mean, look, I think, you know, honest answer is, you know, you, t you, you take a portfolio approach. Um, you know, I'll say that, you know, I've had the, I've had the, the pleasure and honor, and I mean that sincerely of having a, um, uh, an every other Friday afternoon meeting with one of the top five wealthiest people on the planet, Ben, I don't know. And he, um, his investment thesis is to invest in creativity. Um, and I have found it extraordinary and actually really rewarding that that works. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, you can do that. Like you, you can actually um, invest in what you believe in um, and, you know, and, and, and make money for a lot of people in creative culture and, you know, craftsmanship and, of course, there's a lot of, of business and, and money making that goes on in it, but there's also the support of entire industries that would go away without it. You know, the, the, the craft of, of, you know, making leather or making things out of leather, the craft of, um, of jewelry making and these sorts of things. So I suppose that I would, you know, look, look for those types of, of opportunities. I'd probably also, you know, be looking for things that are, um, you know, that are, that are about kind of, you know, good use of tech um, in addition, because I think that if you look at the, the, the top three threats to humanity, um, you know, in the, you know, I mean, I, I think it, I find it interesting and it was illuminating to me to learn that climate change was not in the top three, um, that top three is nuclear destruction, uh, pandemics, and artificial intelligence probably are the top three threats. If you think about, you know, what could, wipe out four to seven and a half billion people. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's those, it's those three things. So I think if you, if you had that kind of an opportunity, you'd want to try to tackle, you know, those, those, those top, those top three big, you know, big threats. Wow. Thank you, Tom. I think we're probably closing in on the witching hour. Wow. Court Fritz. We this are. This is like, Hey everybody. What's up, Charles? Um, Brian Zisk. Yes. This really is like a family reunion, guys. Thank you for uh, 
getting me to do this. Y'all should come to Paris and visit me. What's up, Dan Macta? They won't let us in. <laughs> I mean, seriously, they don't want us in. Yeah. Because believe me, many of us would very be very happy in Paris with you right now. <laughs> hey, Ian, I've got a good question for you that comes from a mutual friend, Ralph Simon. Mm -hmm. Ra Ralph has asked a question uh, that says, what do you think of French creativity versus American creativity now that you've been in Paris for five years? Is there more spontaneity in French creativity than the USA? I don't, I don't think so, actually. I think that, you know, first of all, I, 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 find, I find the generalizations um, really difficult. I think, it, but it's something that, that, you know, and here's a generalization for you, um, just to be a hypocrite. Uh, you know, there's definitely a lot of generalizing that I hear all day, every day. You know, if, if, if my friends, I mean, I suppose, you know, generations before mine did, but if in my friend group, we talked about, you know, the Mexicans, right? The way that the French talk about the Italians or the Germans, like people look at each other sideways. Like, what do you, what do you, come on, don't generalize like that. Also, I think that there's a spirit from where we come from, you know, where, I mean, especially like, you know, I, I escaped the Midwest and moved to California. You know, you, you don't, you, you, I don't know. I think about people the way I think about um, music. I think most of it is garbage, right? And you're always looking for the 90, you know, the 1% that's incredible, right? Um, in, in, in all of the same with people, same with music. You're looking for the 1% that are amazing. And, you know, most of them you're not going to really connect with. Right. But that said, I think, you know, you, you can make generalizations. And from my perspective, they're based on the fact that, um, you know, every time I, I stand up in front of a group of, of people here in France, and they always ask me the question, what's it like to be a guy that moved from California to France, from Apple to LVMH, you know, like from music to luxury. I'm like, well, guess what? I did my 23 and me. And you know what it told me about my DNA? I'm European. Like there's nothing in my 23 and me that said I'm American. Like that doesn't, that doesn't exist, right? Um, unless you are a native American, um, you know, I think it makes a lot more sense to, to re, um, you know, reconsider kind of white America, at least as the Europeans who left. So I think on some level, you know, we're frontiers people, um, our ancestors are frontiers people. And I think that, you know, and I, and I, I this was like kind of summarized for me one day, I was sitting at Deus in Venice um, I'd lived here, but I was back, you know, uh, back, back visiting family and like typing on my computer sitting a dais and there's these two guys next to me and the, I'll never forget the conversation was about surfing, where to rent a helicopter, the cannabis company they're starting, the show they're selling to Netflix and how they're going to buy a tuk tuk on Alibaba and uh, start a food truck with it. And I was like, oh, okay, I get it. Californians are annoying because everything is possible and the French are annoying because nothing is possible. Everything is impossible. And, and so there's, there's definitely a sense here again, coming up with what, what Peggy was saying earlier, you know, about seeing opportunity. I think that there's, there's definitely this optimism, anything's possible, everything's possible um, in the U S and here there are much more boxes. Um, you know, people care about, I mean, even when I came here, the, the papers wanted to know what my parents did, you know, like they wanted to know what kind of family I came from, because that's important here. Um, and I proudly told them my mom's a nurse and my dad's a fireman, right? You know, it's not what they wanted to hear, but to me, that's the American story. That's the American dream. Whereas here, there's, there's more about the box. You, you go from this to that, to this, to that. Of course, though, like the great part about that is that also creates rebellion. Right, the stories, the stories that break that are the are the great stories. We have a friend here named Usama Amar, who is you know an immigrant, um, is, or the son of an immigrant. His mom was a cleaning lady, and he's become you know a tech entrepreneur. You know, one of the the biggest tech entrepreneurs, and I think he's like the biggest angel investor in the world. Xavier Niel, who I bumped into at lunch today, you know, he didn't come from one of those French families that, that everybody wants him to come from. So your question was more about, or Ralph's question was more about creativity. I'm not sure that I, that I know or have a sense of that, but, you know, I think there's a good mix. Like if you look at LVMH, it's actually a very international company. So it's run by a French family, but the person I write, wrote report to, Tony Belloni, he is, is Italian, of course, 
Chantal Camperlay who runs um, Human Resources is Swiss. Uh, you know, Pietro Beccari who runs Dior is Italian. Virgil Abloh is a skateboard DJ from Rockford, Illinois. Matthew Williams, who is the creative director at Givenchy, is a skateboarder from San Luis Obispo, California. You know, it, it's like, it's, it's, um, I think that again, to me, it comes back to that 1%. You know, I don't think you can make a judgment and say, you know, it comes from this place or that place. I think that, that you know, it's, it, it's um, creativity is rare wherever it comes from. I mean, if you'd have told me that um, the kid in the wheelchair from Degrassi High would be one and who's Canadian would be a well-respected rapper, I'd have said no fucking way, <laughs> right? So I guess you don't know, uh, you know, where this, where this stuff comes from a lot of times, right? Amen. Hey, one more question from the audience, and that is, you've got such a cool looking Zoom. They want to know, how did you light that? Or, what's, or what gives it that <laughs> Vermeer treatment? I'm going to give credit to my girlfriend on this one. You're just in my living room. There's nothing fancy here. This is a lamp that came from uh, um, Demora Studios. Um, and um, this is just, there's no you know, magic background here. This is just records and books. I'll tell you one thing though, I came here, I, I'm, all of my records and books are in storage in Los Angeles. So this is only what I've accumulated since I moved here, um, which is, uh, I guess I have, I have both pride and embarrassment. No, that's good for the music industry. You're rebuying your own catalog. <laughs> I'm selling on Discogs now too. I have a 100% have a rating. Um, oh. So please like, don't be afraid to buy from me. Uh, <laughs> Well, on behalf of the audience, so let me say to both of you, thank you so much. Peggy, this has been remarkable. You slayed it as I knew you would. And oh, Ian, what a treat for all of us to catch up with you. Five years seems like a millennium, but uh, you know, we'll leave a light on for you in the music industry because we certainly could use your creativity and genius back in it. So come Thanks. on back home. Look, look I, I appreciate it. You know, when... Um, uh, you know, one of the people that I've made friends with since being here is, is the, the CEO of Vivendi. And, um, you know, so whenever Lucien gets tired of, uh, of that job he has, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm ready to parachute back in. And uh, no, I'm just kidding. Do you know any good music industry headhunters that might help you with that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, Tom, Tom, you got my number, man. That, 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 that comes up. You give me, you give me a call. Indeed, I will. I get, hey, I get thank Jimmy to write me a, a letter of referral. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks again to both of you. And also thank you for shouting out about this Friday's event, Ian. We're featuring Scott Galloway. This week is a, honestly a high water mark for this event series to have you on Tuesday and Galloway on Friday. Honestly, I don't know what we can do to possibly top this. So uh, Scott, Scott is so amazing. He's one of the, one of the greatest people that I've met in this, in this industry. And, um, you know, if you stay for two more minutes, I'll give you a story that tells you what kind of a human being Scott is. And, and an investor. Okay, so Scott, as you guys will see, he's a little cantankerous. Um, and so my daughter, who is now 30, she started her own company. It's called Ration. If you go to ration.fyi, you can, you can check it out. Um, and she's raising money. It's maybe a year and a half ago. And she wants to, wants me to connect her to Scott Galloway because she listens to his podcast. And I'm like, you know, I don't think, I don't think I'm going to introduce you to Scott. Like, let's, let's go like, cause like Scott, Scott can be a little harsh, you know, I don't want him to like, you know, dash your dreams, you know, well, let's get a little further along before we call Scott was my message to her. So then, you know, she's, she's, uh, she's persistent. A couple weeks later, maybe a month later, she's like, come on dad, introduce me to Scott. I really want to meet Scott. She's cause she's a fan. Right. I'm like, okay, okay. I warned you, but okay. So, um, and she's raised zero dollars. She's had zero luck at this point. And uh, Scott says he'll, he'll talk to her. He listens to her pitch and he says, Zoe, listen, this is a great idea. This needs to exist. He's like, I'm not sure if you're gonna be the one who creates it, if it'll be somebody else, but I, I, I believe that this idea will work and someone will do it. And um, if you can raise $250,000, I will be 50,000 of that and you can use my name to raise the other 200. And I honestly, like, I mean, I think she cried, you know, is her, so that, that's, you know, as, as kind of as rough as Scott is, that is how kind of smart, decisive, supportive, 
And you know, there's some people that can talk a good game, but when you're willing to put your own money behind your bluster, that's, that's something real. Scott Galloway is the real deal. That's what, so anyway, definitely tune into that. And what's the name of your daughter's company? It's called Ration. If you go to ration.fyi, um, you'll see like there's, it doesn't, there's no, you can't download the app yet. Um, if you email me, I can, I, I can connect you to her and she'll probably send you a version of it on test flight. It works. It works. And she's going to go out and raise her kind of like proper seed ground now. That's what she's doing. Well, cool. Well, thanks for sharing that. An inadvertent, an inadvertent plug for my daughter's fundraising. Sorry. I love it. I will, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll see you all. I see so many familiar names, man. It's good to, it's good to see you all. And, um, and uh, yeah, Michelle, I'll see what I can do about, uh, about Kanye's masters. Um, maybe when we have that billion, we can do it, to, we can do it together. Jim Griffin, holy shit. And, um, you know, yeah, you guys call me, any of you. Ian, you better be careful what you ask for. Your phone may start ringing momentarily. But sincerely, thank you for this. We've all benefited from your wisdom and, and everything you've shared. And please let us know what we can do to help you. With that, yeah. folks, I'm signing off. I want to remind everybody to be nice to everybody else. Please vote on November 2nd. It's coming up soon. November 3rd, sorry. I wish it was the 2nd. Um, and I will see you on Friday. Later. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Peggy. Thank you for inviting me, guys. Really appreciate it.